talking it, to it in podcast form where I might be releasing videos that you won't find on YouTube, including the fact that there will be videos on YouTube, not just the audio, if you're at all interested in that little added component. As for today, we're going to talk about the simulacrum. Now, we're talking about it in terms of Jean Baudrillard, who is, is pretty prophetic when it comes to talking about this idea. But he is by no means the only person in the history of philosophy to have spoken about it. From Plato all the way to Deleuze, there are many other thinkers who have had very strong opinions about this, this idea. And so for that reason, what I'm discussing it today, I'm really focusing on how Baudrillard uses it because he's near and dear to my heart. Now, I wanna say that I'm going to be a little bit picky with how we approach Baudrillard's interpretation here. And I wanna say this because anyone can dig through his work, find quotes that might not line up with what I'm saying, and rather than me saying, ignore them, I actually want you to, if you find them, include them in comments, and I'll try to pin uh, you know, the most you know, prescient ones, at least the ones that pose a challenge to what I'm doing here, just to give a really good understanding of how Baudrillard's work changes, how it uh, mutates across time, and really how much of a contradictory thinker he is. But one of the reasons I'm doing this episode is because I see a lot of confusion around this term. But one of the other things that worries me a lot is that there isn't confusion sometimes. Sometimes people think they know what they're talking about with this term without really getting into the nitty gritty of it. And the fact that Baudrillard had such wild ideas about the simulacrum. So for that reason, I want to try with this video to demystify some of those ideas, some of the, some of the kind of complexities behind it. So how I believe many people misinterpret his work, or at least this term, is that they associate it pretty specifically with various technologies that emerged in the 20th century. So we can point to some like television, the internet, you know, social media. And they say that these things are indicative of what Baudrillard calls sim the simulacrum. Now, while that is true, and indeed, these are examples of what Baudrillard is talking about, and in many cases, they are symptoms of it, they by no means stand in for what the simulacrum is. And that is just what I will say immediately here before getting into it in more detail. It extends much further back than these new technologies. In fact, it could be said that we've always had simulacra. They've existed forever, so long as humans have uh, existed socially and have produced art, religion, anything like that. Now, to get a proper understanding of this term demands that you have engaged with three key texts, at least, at the very least, many more of Baudrillard, some 40-some books, and at least 30 of them he writes about the simulacrum. So in order to get a really strong understanding, and if you want one, I've pretty much done an episode on each one of his books on this channel, so you can go check those out if you'd like. Uh, but to really grasp the simulacrum in my mind, in the easiest way, yet the way that I believe is the most faithful to Baudrillard's project, we have to look at three key texts, and they are Symbolic Exchange and Death, Simulacra and Simulation, and The Perfect Crime. Now, another one that is extremely important, but I'm not gonna to touch on here, is the transparency of evil. And I'll explain closer to the end why that one is important, but why I don't include it in here. And the reason I will say just for now is that I think it muddies the waters a little bit and makes it a little bit more difficult to engage with the broader uh, idea. Now, with that being said, it's a completely important, and I think that you should go and read it and develop some kind of understanding about it. So we're gonna move through these texts chronologically, starting with Symbolic Exchange and Death, the one that he wrote first of these three. Now, Symbolic Exchange and Death, written in the mid 70s, was by no means his first exposition into this thing called the simulacrum. As early as the consumer society, his, his second book, and even there are moments in the system of objects, in the consumer society, we get a kind of real developed understanding of the simulacrum in the form of his recounting a story called The Student in Prague, in which the student 
beckons the devil or makes a pact with the devil to have a copy of himself made. And the story concludes with this student killing his copy just to feel himself having been killed as well. So with the death of the copy comes the death of the original, which we can certainly see the roots of the idea of the simulacrum with this story. Now, as for symbolic exchange and death, this is the first text in which he outlines the successive phases of the simulacrum, and they come out in three different orders. There's the first, second, and third order. The first order operates on the natural law of value. This was the era of the counterfeit. Now, what, what does that mean, the counterfeit? Well, what he's saying here is that at a time in which there was certain class divides, when there was a certain amount of um, what Thorstein Veblen calls pecuniary decency attached to dress, attached to one's presentation, then what we saw was the kind of combating, or combatment, combating? Anyways, of various signs in how one dressed, in how one existed in the world. So there was then a kind of competition about what went on as far as one's position in the world. Now this could only arise at a certain point in our kind of historical development. Prior to that, it might have been said that we were existing under the aegis of reality. Indeed, he says this about it. The principle of simulation governs us now, rather than the outdated reality principle. Now hold on to that quote, because we're going to trouble it by the time we get to the end of this. But for now, keep that in mind, that this first order simulacrum that arises in the classical age was for him the first moment in which we have moved away from reality into the simulacrum or into simulation. Now, I will say that simulacra and simulation are not interchangeable, and there are some distinctions to be made, but we'll get into that in a little bit. That propels us here into the second order that he lays out, and that is the, uh, what he calls the market law of value, or it is governed by the market law of value. So whereas under the first order, people were governed by maybe class, in the sense that people had use the term class pretty loosely here, where people might have had uh, a kind of desire to demonstrate themselves on the basis of their social position, which might not have had to do with class, you know, it could be royalty, blood, anything like that. What we see with the market law value is a governing mode of production in which people have direct attachment not to a kind of, you know, bloodline or heritage or culture, but pure operationality. People are reduced at this point to cogs in a machine in which they aren't allowed to kind of exert a play of appearances upon themselves. They are simply to work, to be the most operational, to be the most functional for the service or in the service of the system. Now, how does the simulacrum operate there? It operates in that things are being produced that don't have a very firm connection to reality, and hence their kind of simulated nature. But this mode of production, the way by which these images are produced, is something diametrically different to what we saw previously, and that's why it ne necessitates a different kind of definition, that is, under the market law of value and under production. So that propels us here now into the third order, which is what he calls the, uh, governed by the structural law of value. And this is also the era of the code. Now what the code is, is a moment in which all signs, all images, are free floating, at least on the surface. They float and they exchange themselves with other signs. So any sign can relate to any other without any connection to reality, without any connection to the world, without any connection to history. They instead just bounce and have absolutely no correspondence with anything whatsoever. Now he calls this, or he positions this under the structural law of value, because he says the structural law of value implies that there is, despite this kind of rhizomatic veneer, or this kind of indeterminate veneer, a, a hidden underbelly, a kind of hidden rigid underbelly that controls these movements to some extent. Or, as he says in one book, I believe it was 
um, The Illusion of the End, which at the beginning uh, is titled, the, the first chapter is like, we should skip to the year 2000 or, or something like that. He says, we are okay to be political, but not too much. You know, we are okay to be radical, but not too much. So we see that in our endless proliferation, not endless possibility, but actually a very restricted possibility guided by not uh, endless potential, but it is guided by the rules and codes laid out for us. So that's how he kind of characterizes more or less these successive phases starting out symbolic exchange and death. Now he goes further and he says that what is at the heart of this move toward the simulacrum or these three phases of the simulacrum is the move towards objectivity. And with objectivity, what he says is governed by science, he says that that puts away or puts an end to all origins. It puts an end to all mystery and it puts everyone under the kind of spectral light of scientific observation. And this has pretty far-reaching consequences. If we take genetics, for example, kind of the, one of the key historical arguments leveled to justify racism, what we see here is the reduction of all people, not to their history, not to their location in the world, but specifically to something that they cannot change that is just quote-unquote natural about their identity, be it race or gender or anything like that, that allows very little mobility and very little flexibility. So we see then, or what he says, what he says then is that opinions, identities, are reduced to a kind of statistical, to a kind of statistical perfection, where opinions are reduced to poles, where identities are reduced to commodities that filter all people's own modes of self-expression through a highly coded rigid formula that is determined by an overarching system that governs more or less everyone. So while there might not be people that abide by it, those people that still don't abide by it are marked precisely by the fact that they do not comply to the system. Now that puts us here into Simulacra and Simulation, probably his most popular text, and one that I will say is probably my least favorite, but that's neither here nor there. And I think that this text is the reason there are quite a few misunderstandings about his idea of the simulacrum. And he starts out, or I guess one of the reasons that we could see this, some of these confusions, is that he starts out with this fable by uh, Jean-Louis Bolge. And this fable was where a map was, um, where details were added to a map in such a way that the map actually began to stand in for the territory itself. The map grew so expansive and so detailed that it actually covered the entire territory it was meant to represent. Now what we see here, or what he uses this fable to say, is that this map uh, stands in for the, uh, the territory underneath. What we're left with is a kind of simulation of the territory itself. Now he looks upon this fable and he says, oh, well, that's interesting, but it really doesn't get at the heart of the matter. And that is, it doesn't really explain the situation that we find ourselves in today. And that is because today we do not have this distinction between the territory and the map. Instead, these two things have folded in completely to one another. Or in other words, we don't have a distinction between reality and simulation anymore. These two things have folded into one another. So we can't say reality exists over here, simulation exists over here, or we can extend this to say that the natural doesn't exist over here and simulation exists over here. They instead are intertwined. So he criticizes any idea that there is simply reality on one side and simulation on the other. This is how he criticizes the matrix which we find in The Conspiracy of Art, which is kind of a strange text uh, in my mind. But he says that if we treat the world like the matrix, that is, we have the matrix, which is the simulated world, and on the other side, we have Zion, the kind of resistor city, 
then we treat this problem too much in a Platonist way. That is, there being a very clear split between reality and simulation. And he doesn't like that. He thinks that that is too reductive. So there is no more reality. Instead, what we have is hyper-reality. Now we're going to trouble this a little bit as we go on, but for now, let's just keep this moniker up here, hyper-reality. And that, for the moment, we can say is coextensive with the simulacrum. And I want to say as kind of an aside that when Baudrillard was writing this, you know, he was a Parisian, um, and when Parisians use the word hyper or hypo, they attach it to things in a pretty um, nonchalant way. It, it's, it's a pretty common thing to do if someone was like, I don't know, um, if something is like cool or fascinating, you know, they'll say hyper cool, right? Like something is very cool, which is not really commonplace in English. Uh, so for us, I think when we read this, we think hyper is like extreme, like we think uh, hyperspeed, and we might think of like science fiction, like Star Wars, time travel, space travel, stuff like that. When he uses it, it's, it's a lot more banal. But anyways, that's just an aside, something I think is important to mention. But in this book, still Simulacra and Simulation, he lays out four more phases to the uh, movement of not broad society at large, but rather of the image itself. So in Symbolic Exchange and Death, we had the three successive phases of the simulacrum. Here he gives us, gives us the four phases of the image, and they are as follows. So firstly, the image is a reflection of a profound reality. Then it masks and denatures a profound reality. Then it masks the absence of a profound reality. And then finally, it has no relation whatsoever to any reality. It is just a pure simulacrum. So what is this? What do these phases mean? Well, he says that he, well, he doesn't really explain. And this is one of the kind of mysteries of, of his work. But let me just give examples that might explain it to some extent. So the first one, that is the first phase, and that is that it replicates a profound reality, could be something like cave paintings, for example, in which animals, and in some cases humans, were carved into the earth. Now these were simulations, they were copies of a profound reality that existed out there in the world. And certainly at the time that can be said that you couldn't have reality and then you can have simulation. Now the second one, it masks and denatures a profound simulation, might be more in line with the first order that we saw in Symbolic Exchange and Death, where we see people using fashion and dress to cover who they are underneath. And it, it actually stands in for that reality. So these people aren't who they are underneath. They become the dress that they wear, for example. The third phase being the phase in which it uh, kind of conceals the fact that there is no reality underneath is when we totally lose sight of the fact that there could be anything underneath where the person wearing certain clothing, let's say um, a priest, for example, becomes exactly that. They are the only thing that they are doing that is which manifests itself in their clothing and they cannot be anything other. And what we come to find is that that is more true than what exists underneath. Because that dress, let's say they're wearing robes, like in Catholicism, they're wearing robes. These robes actually stand for more than the bare person underneath. Indeed, there's actually nothing underneath because these robes are the absolute everything. They are in some, I guess, to some people, God. Now, the fourth phase is that we have no relationship whatsoever to any reality at all. And this is where it gets a little bit weird or tricky, but we can just imagine this in any way uh, that is completely detached from any history at all. So, for example, uh, take some new fashion trend that happens to emerge one week of, of, of any period of time. 
it has no attachment to any kind of history. It instead just emerges for the sake of being a new thing. It accrues its um, kind of uh, cultural capital through that fact, by that fact, because it doesn't actually have a history that could burden it, that could that could bother it. It is purely new, and by virtue of it being new, gains its power, gains its kind of uh, authority in a cultural setting. Now, he, he laments, or he looks upon with sadness, the loss of the antagonism between reality and um, and simulation. So like when we had the map and the territory, there was a kind of antagonism present there. And there was a duel, which is a pretty important word in, in Baudrillard's work. But there was a duel, and there was, there was friction, and there was resistance, and it was by virtue of that that people were allowed to change and develop governed by the code of, or by the code, governed by the law of seduction, which is another key term that I won't get into here. Now let's consider, because I think that this is probably the most important text to understand this term, the perfect crime. In the perfect crime, he demystifies some of the concerns that might arise, arise from this, his whole formula, right? That might arise from his ideas about the simulacrum. And what he says is that reality and simulation are not opposed. So you don't have reality on one side and simulation on the other. In fact, he says that they are two sides of the same coin. And he says that illusion is what opposes simulation and therefore reality. So it'd be wrong to say that, hey, look, we have these kind of online interactions. It's not real. We should get back to engaging with people one-on-one -on -one because that would be like a real thing. Or we might have heard this a thousand times, like we want more meaningful, we want more real connections with people, not fake ones. Or take the example of uh, the recent movie by, um, I guess it was Spielberg, uh, Ready Player One. Uh, did he direct it? Anyways, the movie Ready Player One, in which at the very end, the... The protagonist makes the point and kind of mandates that people have to be away from their screens for, I think it's like two days out of the week, because it's meant for them to get back to nature, to get back to reality. Now, Baudrillard would look upon that as a total incorrect way to diagnose this problem, because we are still immersed in simulation, even away from our screens, where our dress, our interactions with one another, everything that we do is mediated by the structural law of value and by the code. We are meant to be operational. We are meant to not have opinions. We are meant to, you know, be reduced to statistics, to polls, to apathy. We are meant to be political. And all of these things, which are components of the simulacrum, at least the third order simulacrum, manifest themselves away from the screens. So it would be wrong, and I really want to stress that it doesn't exist purely in relation to screens, and that's where we get this all wrong. And that's why he says that illusion is what opposes simulation and reality. It's not simulation and reality oppose one another, but illusion does. Because illusion breaks away from the confinement of the code. It breaks away from the structural law of value because it does not abide by any scientific theorem. It can't be explained away via some kind of pure uh, mode of reasoning or understanding. Like, religion might be one example, but he's critical of that too, because, you know, people aren't given opinions. People aren't allowed to engage with religion, really. They're just told what to believe. But it is a relic, kind of, of a time in which people could engage in very esoteric way on their own terms where they could engage in one of his key, later terms kind of key terms uh, in their own kind of singularity to be who they want to be which does not lend itself to the structural law of value because you have to be reduced to a kind of data point to a kind of cybernetician which is what he calls it uh, in the early 70s to a cybernetician in order to exist under the structural law of value and the code 
So it's important then that we understand the role of illusion in opposing reality and simulation. And he goes so far as to say that one of the big problems in all of this is that we still believe that there exists a kind of reality and an objectivity. And it is so wrong when we believe that this reality is what is at risk through these uh, the through the emergence of new technologies like social media, for example. And he goes so far as to say in The Perfect Crime that the proliferation of reality is our true catastrophe. So one example that I love to use under to kind of uh, describe this or to explain this is in terms of like gender or gender identity, where it is believed that if you have a certain, uh, the way that you were designated when you were born, being male or female, determines who you are. And that you can only manifest yourself in that way, according to these, what are taken to be true kind of cultural markers or kind of true cultural uh, insignia, where if you're a boy, you have to, you know, wear blue and, and like dark colors and want to play with guns and, and all of these kinds of things for some reason, even though that has absolutely nothing natural about it. There's nothing natural about any of these colors. There's nothing natural about any of these kind of toys that boys are supposed to like to play with. They are culturally specific. But we erase that and we take it to be true. It is reality. And therefore, uh, it limits the possibilities afforded to people because they are just told what they can and cannot like. So there's another key point that comes out of the perfect crime. And that is when he says that reality can be broken into either conflictual or non-contradictory reality. And it would follow then, because we know that reality and simulation are two sides of the same coin, that there can be conflictual and non-contradictory simulation. Now, what does that mean? Well, he says that we've always had simulation and we've always had reality. Is when we move from conflictual to non-contradictory reality or simulation, where the conflictual is a space in which there's negotiation. We have illusion, we have debate, we have argument, we have uh, the kind of combating of different ideas. And in non-contradictory, what we have is the effacement of all negativity in favor of a pure operationality, where people can be, like I said already, reduced to a data point that can be easily controlled and, and mandated by, you know, some kind of cultural codes that are taken to be true or real. So in that way, simulation is not bad in itself, nor is reality. The simulacrum kind of is, though, and the simulacrum, along with hyperreality, are things that he laments, but, or things that he doesn't, he admonishes. But with that being said, excoriate, that's another good word. And, but another thing he says is that we never really have been fully simulated because if there was a point in which we were fully simulated or given totally over to the simulacrum, then the world would cease to exist, which is a pretty bombastic statement, but one in, that I think has a lot of potency in that if things were to be given over to pure real time, everything would be immediately apparent at any moment. And what we would see is the complete disillusionment of anything that we know in its realization, what he calls the obscenity of events, the obscenity of the image. So he maintains that despite these moves towards more reality, more simulation in their non-contradictory way, what we see is the maintenance, even if it's just a glimmer of illusion or seduction, you know, that other key term, that can't ever be fully exercised, that can't ever be fully taken away. And we see that, and this is where we get Baudrillard's real optimism for the future, because in my mind, a lot of hope. And he held out hope. Uh, and while there are certainly moments in which it would, seems like he's, he's nihilistic, and he probably was, I think in his overall project, his overall trajectory is one of hope for the future, but one that has to be fought for and cultivated by people caring, not giving themselves over. And it's not people's choice. No one chooses this but being awakened to the fact that they are not free to be how they want or to exist in the way that they want, 
but they have to be reduced to an easily digestible kind of simulation or a code. And that's, that's my spiel on it. I only scratch the surface, like I said, uh, the transparency of evil introduces like another phase, the fourth phase of the simulacrum, which I don't want to get into now because that's, it, in some cases, it's just a rehashing of the idea that we're not attached to any reality, um, which is pretty much all he says is that we're just totally detached at this point. But it's still interesting, so go and read it. Uh, but yeah, if you like what I did here, you know, like, share, subscribe. I would love any support I can get. Like I said in my announcement video, I don't know when I'm going to be able to do the next one. Uh, so make sure you subscribe so you can actually be kept up to date and hit that bell button. Um, I don't really know what the bell does, but anyways, I, get, I think you get notified. I don't know if that's like a notification on your phone or whatever, but um, yeah, let me know what other kind of terms you want to see, uh, and then I'll catch you next time. Take care.